Hello and welcome to the Ethiopian Digest program called Ethiopian Digest in conversation with. In our program, we bring people from around the world, those who care about Ethiopia, those connected to Ethiopia, those who want to do something for Ethiopia and with Ethiopians. Today, I've got a guest from the United States of America. Your host is Bekalo Yecha. <music> I've got Mel Tawahide. He's going to say a lot about himself. Mel, it's your time. Tell us a bit about yourself. Who is Mel? Well, thank you, Bakana, for giving me this opportunity to share my life with uh, your audience. Uh, my name is Mel Tawahide. I was born in Ethiopia some 62 years ago and uh, basically had a beautiful childhood a nice life when all of a sudden in 1974, there was a communist mayhem in Ethiopia. And as a result of that, I was forced to flee the country in 1977 through Eritrea and Massawa. And I was in Sudan for some time and eventually made it to Germany. From Germany, I made it to Canada in 1980. And uh, 1980, I was uh, living in Canada applied for political asylum and I was uh, ultimately granted that permission to stay in Canada and I was very grateful for the opportunity that was given to me. I attended the University of Toronto and then after that I uh, started working uh, in the, the newspaper business and eventually I started working in the financial planning business which I've been doing now for 37 odd years. And so uh, through my company uh, called Metropolitan Life, an American company that was also had offices in Canada, I was given the opportunity to transfer out to Colorado as a, a vice president responsible for ethnic market because of the languages I speak, including German, Ethiopian and Arabic and so forth. And so I was able to come to Colorado and uh, a few years after I arrived, I paid uh, my dues to Metropolitan Life and eventually went on to start my own company called Infinity Wealth Management in 1998. So the company has been in existence for 22 years. I also purchased another company in Canada called Infinity Retirement Solutions. So I own both companies. I'm 100% owner of all the shares. And so we at this time uh, also uh, decided that I was going to go to film school and went to New York Film Academy and uh, learn uh, how to make films. And so I became a producer and a director of uh, eight documentary films, mostly Ethiopia. I felt like nobody was interested in Ethiopia, but I was always interested in Ethiopia. It didn't matter if people did not, were not interested. Uh, and I realized that young people really don't care about, most young people nowadays have got a hard time understanding history. Even Americans themselves don't care much about John F. Kennedy or Eisenhower and things like that. And not a whole lot of people even know what Winston Churchill was and so forth. So it's unfortunate that the younger generation doesn't appreciate much history. But uh, as a historian, I was always interested to record it. And what a better way to record history than documentary films. So I made eight documentary films, mainly focusing on the US contribution to Ethiopian educational system from 1950 to 1977. And so really that has been a lot of passion, a lot of love. And uh, you know, the film is available now with Amazon and uh, things like that. And I used to go around the country and show the documentary film. And uh, we will be making it available also in Amharic shortly. So that's the kind of stuff that I've been doing in my life. That's excellent and amazing to be honest. And I think uh, we, should, we should promote the work you've done uh, using all tools available because that's going to help Ethiopians and people who want to know about Ethiopia. You know, uh, I can see that you are a global citizen because you've been 
going through Africa to Europe and Canada and US, United States of America. How do you feel about it? Well, I am uh, now that it's uh, passed. It seems like God has it in a plan for my life to go to all these places and uh, really experience different things. And so first one was Eritrea. Uh, it was really at that time Ethiopia. And uh, it was beautiful. There were nice people. And unfortunately, the circumstances were different. Uh, there was a civil war. Uh, Eritrea was trying to break away. And there was a lot of uh, brutality on both sides. And uh, then after that, I came to Sudan, which happened to be a very, very kind people and uh, really intelligent people. They were British colony for a long time. And uh, they are really very kind and really a civil society. And I was sad to hear that they were getting into all kinds of problems and the country breaking up after I left into South Sudan and Sudan and uh, uh, having problem in the West called Darfur. And all those problems were not apparent to me when I was there in 1977. It was really a beautiful country with a beautiful attitude about life and very helpful. And they felt the pain that we were going through as Ethiopians. So they helped a lot of uh, people from Gondar or uh, other provinces like Eritrea, other provinces like Tigray. And they were helping all of us and they were really good people. And then after that, Canada, I mean, Germany was very good, gave me an opportunity to go to school there and learn German. And, uh, and then after that, I was able to make it to Canada uh, where I got married to a Caribbean girl. And we've been married now for 38 years. And so life has been really, really good. I can't complain. Uh, I survived two cancers and uh, a car accident a civil war in Ethiopia. So I'm still here for reasons that are really sometimes hard to understand, but uh, God is good and I am still here and uh, beautiful day to talk to you, Bakale. Just a great opportunity. Thank you. It's really helpful uh, to, to kind of know, know all those things, all of your journey, you know, uh, uh, someone born in Ethiopia, traveling on the way, you know, making it on his own. And now a serial entrepreneur, and you, you are honestly an, a serial one, not a single entrepreneur for that matter. And uh, you, you are now running this wonderful wealth management organization. Was it and any intention to, t to kind of bring this sort of organization to Ethiopia? Yeah, Ethiopia was uh, really, uh, I've been going back to Ethiopia a lot lately. Uh, I'm also thinking, uh, doing a lot of uh, work with the Lions Club of Denver, trying to bring some eyeglasses to the rural people in Ethiopia. Uh, I've gone into Makale, into Aksum, and uh, Gondar, Ladibela, Shashamane, uh, Agar Salam. Shoni, Walaita, Arbaminch, and uh, Konso. All these are places that we worked over the last, oh, I would say about eight years. Uh, we distributed probably about 10,000 eyeglasses, prescription glasses, that is. And uh, life is beautiful. Uh, uh, our business is kind of complex business. Uh, wealth management, uh, Ethiopia is not at the position to really launch a big wealth management because we really need a, first thing we need is a stock exchange. Ethiopia does not have stock exchange. So until we set up a stock exchange, it's gonna be very difficult to have a wealth management business, but it's not very far with this uh, reformist and uh, a good uh, prime minister and uh, progressive people looking forward to integrate Ethiopia to the rest of the world and drop their communist past I think Ethiopia is going to do very well now. I think they are coming together. They've been uh, a lot of the communist elements, including uh, Tigray liberation that was a Marxist, have been a really, uh, have been a very difficult impediment for development. And so now those people are not in charge anymore and things will look very promising for Ethiopia. And so 
we need to uh, uh, accelerate the uh, commitment of uh, personal uh, investment, uh, direct investment from foreign countries like United States, Canada, United Kingdom. Uh, and we have to give the foreigners uh, a guarantee that they will be able to repatriate their profits and they will have also property rights and, and their product and their services and their assets are all protected by the laws of Ethiopia and international law. So as long as Ethiopia is doing uh, no more of communist stuff and uh, uh, it's going to guarantee safety and civil society, I think there'll be a lot of people who'll be interested in investing in Ethiopia. Thank you, Mel. Yes, Ethiopia is on, on a change uh, journey and it's vital that Ethiopia kind of brings investment into Ethiopia. And what do you think is missing and what should and what could Ethiopians and people of Ethiopia already around the world could do to promote investment in, in Ethiopia and what could the government do at the same time? Okay, Ethiopian government, number one, has to have a good uh, foreign uh, trade representatives who speaks very good language, whether it's going to be Danish or Norwegian or uh, English or Canadian English or or British English, whether they're speaking United Kingdom, they got to have uh, preferably uh, Ethiopians that are born there who can uh, make it attractive for uh, foreigners to invest into Ethiopia. So they can open up uh, trade representative offices in their embassies. They don't need an embassy. What they need is trade representatives. Embassy is really useless. What you need is trade. Trade representative in every, in every country and promote Ethiopia. Show how the coffee is going to be profitable. Show how the sesame business is going to be profitable. Show how commodities can be sold in Ethiopia. Show how this boloke or uh, Michigan beans, as we call it here in America, can be feeding all over Middle East and things like that. So make it profitable. And Ethiopia can make this by also discouraging the corrupt uh, bureaucracy and from asking for bribes and things like that and making it difficult for people to invest. So you have to uh, uh, put a, a hold on the uh, so-called government workers who are trying to extort money out of investors, whether they're Ethiopians or foreigners, it doesn't matter. These are really, as they call them in Ethiopia, they are hyenas. They want to basically extort money out of everybody. So we have to have control over those people. We need to have people that care about Ethiopia, that care about promoting civil society, that care about promoting uh, wellness of Ethiopians and foreigners who are investing in Ethiopia. So what is missing is basically what we have to go by is the example of the attracting foreign investment in Ethiopia that went on for the last 10 years. It's not that Ethiopia didn't try, but the way they went about it the last 10 years, I believe, even though it was good try, it was not good enough to attract uh, bona fide, legitimate investors from around the world. Yes, some people from Turkey came to invest, some people from Egypt, some people from Saudi Arabia, and some Indians and so forth came to invest in Ethiopia. But the way they were invited to Ethiopia was not through a legitimate business. They were told that they were going to get free land, which is a big mistake because nobody should be given a land for free. And secondly, you can't promote your country as having a very low wages. That's not a good thing. You're not giving a good example. You want people income to get better. You go, want Ethiopians to have a living wage. Ethiopians are not greedy people but you gotta give them wages that they can live with. They can feed their family, buy the uniform for their kids, buying to exercise books so that kids can go to school. All those things are very critical. So what happened in the last 10 years was they were promoting the wrong type of investors who sometimes were not good because they didn't have enough money that they brought from Turkey. Secondly, they were also not treated well in Ethiopia because the Ethiopian government did not accommodate them the right way by saying to the community that these investors are going to improve everybody's life. They just dropped them in the middle of a farm and said, this is your farm. 
first of all, they didn't buy the land, so the land doesn't belong to them. So the people in the community were annoyed with their land being given without their permission and nobody asked them. So that really made it the, the beginning itself, the start itself was a failure. And then on top of that, when they try to bring tractors and heavy equipment and uh, start working the land, there were a lot of people that didn't like them in their communities. They didn't know how they were going to benefit. Nobody explained to the community how they're going to be benefiting from these foreign investors. So a lot of the investors were mistreated because the information they got was incorrect. And some of them also came to just basically take advantage of Ethiopia. Some of them took even loan from Ethiopian banks and they split, they took off, went back to Turkey or whatever they came from. So it's very critical for Ethiopia to find a bona fide good investors who are interested in building Ethiopia. We don't need a hit and run. What we need is sustainable people that are going to invest and grow their business with the people of Ethiopia. Ethiopians are very honorable people. You can work with them. You can, uh, you can make good money. You can uh, share what you have. Ethiopians are very generous people. They're not greedy. It's not a very difficult place to invest. You can see Ethiopia is being one of really uh, the poorer countries, but Ethiopia is also the second largest country for refugees right now. There's about 4 million refugees in Ethiopia. So they have almost the same number of refugees as they have in the United States. They got South Sudanese, probably half a million of them are there. Uh, the Eritreans, about a million of them are in Ethiopia. Uh, there are a lot of Somalis in Ethiopia. There's a lot of people that are coming, even with the small resources that they have, they're able to accommodate foreigners and, and they've been kind to them. As far as I know, I haven't heard anybody being harmed as a refugee in Ethiopia. So really they are honorable people. Uh, people will see Ethiopia for what it is and they will keep on investing. I think direct investment is what Ethiopia should go after. Thank you, Mel. Yes, when you kind of talked about uh, Ethiopia's hospitality, especially about the refugees in Ethiopia, I could certify that you know the, uh, Ethiopia is one of those countries which has uh, one of the most uh, friendly refugee laws in the world. It. And I'm really, I'm really proud uh, as somebody who actually comes from Ethiopia. It makes me very proud. You know, yeah, I know Mel, you are entrepreneur, a business person, but at the same time, a filmmaker, but also you are a historian. And, you know, you have, you have read a lot, you have written a lot about, you know, uh, Ethiopia's relationship with, uh, with the Western world. Well I'm, I'm especially keen, you know, uh, on the history of uh, Ethiopia with the United Kingdom especially the 1930s. Do you have anything to share? Well, United Kingdom has been a very important uh, country for uh, Ethiopia through and through. Uh, they have supported us through difficult times. Uh, they were there for us and, and we have whatever we could. Uh, as a small country, we were able to help uh, the uh, British uh, to have amicable end to some of this uh, colonial arrangement, for example, in Kenya and a few other places. Ethiopia was helping a lot of countries uh, to stop the civil war in Nigeria. Uh, the Western world didn't want to have anything to do with Nigeria and Biafra. Ethiopia was the one that really stopped that war and with a little bit of resources that we have. And so the British have been very good and good example to us. Uh, in the 1930s, they were uh, the ones who really stood with Ethiopia uh, as uh, Sir Winston Churchill uh, helped Ethiopia to uh, assign a major military operation in Ethiopia. It was one of the first uh, victory for the Allied forces because the British uh, helped us to evict the Mussolini and the Italians out of uh, Ethiopia in 1941. At that time, uh, England really put their prestige, put their name, put their money. They put about two million pound on it to help Ethiopia succeed uh, by sharing their equipments 
Uh, they gave us stuff from Yemen, uh, a, a lot of generals, even from South Africa, who were assigned to Ethiopia, and uh, a lot of uh, beautiful uh, generals. Uh, uh, General Cunningham, Alan Cunningham from the Queen Africa Rifle in Nairobi. He was the one who invaded the Ethiopia from the south, from Moyali and through uh, Awasa and came into Mojo and Addis Ababa in 1941. Actually, he's the first one to get to Addis, uh, even before the emperor. Uh, then we have General Wingate, who came from the west, uh, General Sumford, who came from the west, and General Blatt, who was uh, the uh, uh, general who was responsible for Sudan, but he was the one who was assigned to evict the Italians out of Eritrea in 1941. The, the Eritrean war uh, took some more work, but they were all defeated and the British were able to take over Eritrea and run that place from 1941 to 1952. And they were handed over to Ethiopia. The British have helped us in many, many ways. Uh, after the victory in 1941, the British uh, made a, a arrangement to reestablish Ethiopia from uh, fascist destruction and catastrophe. They were able to set up a new police force. They helped us in setting up a new judicial system with the help of uh, British. And the British also, I am a beneficiary also, in the interest of full disclosure, I benefited from the high school that the British set up called General Wingate that was supported by her uh, uh, Majesty, the Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth. And uh, we benefited from her support of our school. And uh, we also got support from the King of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie I. But uh, the British have done a great marvelous job up to 1944. And as things were getting heated up in Europe, uh, they left Ethiopia to concentrate on uh, evicting Hitler out of this dark days. And uh, we were finally relieved that uh, the British won and uh, the bombardment of uh, London stopped and uh, uh, Ethiopia was free and uh, England was free. And life is beautiful and the British have been very close to us. Uh, and then uh, when the communists came and uh, decimated Ethiopia, it was the queen who really cared about Ethiopia enough uh, to care about the Ethiopian royal family that were uh, suffering inside the communist jail for 14 years, 15 years, some of them. And she got all of them released in 1988. And the Ethiopian communist after that fled in 1991, after this tribal communist showed up in 1991 called TPLF and we just got rid of them. And so Ethiopia was just suffering for the last 46 years. And the British have done a great job uh, of accepting some of our people as refugees, giving them citizenship, giving them passport, and giving them dignity in London, in England, and everywhere. We're very grateful for the United Kingdom. Thanks, Mel. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to take you to uh, Ethiopia again. Uh, I know you are you know, an advocate, great champion of the Ethiopian the GERD, the Grand Renaissance Ethiopian Dam, you know, which, which you'd love to be. I know you've done a bit of work to promote, to promote it. What, do you, what took you into this? And what do you think is uh, going to come actually with GERD and what's missing? Well, uh, first, I mean, I'd like to say what is missing is international support for GERD. We didn't get for international financing World Bank didn't want to get involved. Uh, IMF didn't want to get involved uh, because of the pressure that they were getting from Egypt that Ethiopia doesn't deserve to get a, a loan. So it's self-funded and to a tune of 5 billion US dollars to build this dam. And it's one of the most tenacious, beautiful testimony of self-respect that a poor country with very little resources, went ahead and put money together 
from soldiers, from police officers, from security guards, from day laborers who are making on the average $100 a month. That's Ethiopian wages. Some of them don't even make 100 bucks. A lot of them make about $50 US. And with that little bit of money, they were able to put down $5 billion. That's a testament of self-respect. That's why Ethiopia is a very special people. They have self-respect and determination. So what's missing is international collaboration. When things get better and we prosper tomorrow, we're not gonna forget our friends that helped us. That's why it's very important to help Ethiopia because it's gonna be one of the most beautiful uh, light and beacon for uh, a lot of people, a lot of people. An example for uh, civility, uh, self-determination and being able to, to do that. So I was involved in the dam project because the emperor was trying to get this done since 1958. An American company from Texas came and did the research. And at that point, they were told not to even think about it because of the pressure that was coming from Egypt was so bad. Egypt has been trying to destabilize Ethiopia. They supported the uh, Eritrean movement and to break up Ethiopia into two. Ultimately, they succeeded in breaking up Ethiopia into Ethiopia and Eritrea. They funded Eritrean Liberation Front. Um, they funded Oromo Liberation Front. They funded a lot of Ethiopian uh, bandits to destabilize the country. And so they think it's a great idea for them to destabilize Ethiopia and keep it poor. Uh, it's not about the dam. It's really about having influence. They don't want anybody else to have influence in the Red Sea except them. So whenever they see that in a sub-Saharan country, black people are going to have influence over the Red Sea, they are disturbed. But I say to my Egyptian friends, you don't have to worry about Ethiopia. Ethiopia is the least of your trouble. You need to fix your own system. You need to focus on your own country and rebuilt uh, a country that was run by military dictators for the last 60 years. You don't have a history uh, of, uh, of democracy. When you were given an opportunity to have a democracy, uh, you chose uh, uh, a commun uh, Islamic brotherhood. So that shows me that a lot of work needs to be done. Egypt needs to focus on Egypt. Egypt does not need to focus on Ethiopia because Ethiopia for worse or for better, we have done a good job focusing on ourselves. We made a lot of mistakes the last 50 years, but through our mistakes, we have learned a lot. And I can assure you that this dam will be finished, will be completed, and it will give electricity for a lot of East African countries and even Egypt and uh, Sudan are going to benefit from it because we can either give them electricity, we can control the flow of water and uh, reduce the amount of flooding that's happening in Sudan. Particularly, as you know, this August, they had a big flood that affected the lives of 700,000 people in Sudan. And they lost a lot of livestock, they lost a lot of people. And that shouldn't be if we can control the water from upstream where the mountains, the high mountains of Ethiopia, where the water comes from. So Ethiopia, no matter what, is going to plow forward. Uh, whoever comes along, it's great. And whoever doesn't come will eventually figure out that Ethiopia is not really a very easy place to dismantle. Uh, they've been trying to dismantle Ethiopia for the last 100 and 200 years. But by the grace of God, we're always there. So uh, let me just take you back to uh, to some of my, my my earlier questions. Because as as you kind of talked about the change that's happening in Ethiopia, uh, you know, there's there's those been 
lots of change in the past couple of uh, couple of years, uh, especially uh, since uh, Dr. Ravi came to power. And in the past couple of months, probably the past two months, there's been a lot of change. And what's your hope for Ethiopia? Uh, Ethiopia is really on a on a nice trajectory, uh, changing very nice. Um, some of it is rapid, but some of it is on on target. Uh, so after uh, having a hard tribal communist run the place for 30 years through civil disobedience, there was a change in 2018. On May 2018, the new young prime minister was uh, selected and elected by his own party. And uh, he has since made an incredible move towards uh, democracy and creating a civil society. He released all the prisoners. He created for the first time an opportunity to speak for as much as you want. Freedom of speech was not available in Ethiopia for three, 4,000 years. It's an old kingdom. We can't just say whatever we want. It was a very, in a way, oppressive because uh, kingdom requires that there be conformity. And because of that, a lot of people were not given the right to speak. But this guy within the span of two years has given us an opportunity to speak whatever we like. So the freedom of speech itself is an unbelievable success for Ethiopia that didn't have this for the last three or 4,000 years. So that is by itself is a huge achievement. Then on top of that, he has fixed some of the economy. He has taken some of the discrepancy in the currency theft mm -hmm. and currency manipulation and reestablished the Ethiopian currency, uh, trying to reduce the black market, trying to increase the foreign reserve, trying to increase uh, foreign currency reserve for Ethiopia. It's always uh, doesn't have enough money to buy for the things it needs. Uh, he has made an improvement in, uh, in government. He has uh, created uh, uh, streamlined uh, government agencies uh, that are just unbelievable, fantastic, and that there is a process now. So he's created a system where in the olden days in Ethiopia, he just depended only on individuals. If that individual is sick or dead, you're, everybody's in trouble. Now he created a manual. He created a system where the country can run without depending on individuals. Even Abi, the prime minister himself says, don't depend on me, depend on the system, depend on creating a system. He created an independent judiciary that looks at things and sets up. He set up an independent election board that he doesn't have any say in and and so forth and so forth so uh, there's a lot of uh, good positive things on the negative side for the last two years uh, a lot of this Tigray liberation was very unhappy for losing privilege and losing uh, looting and uh, uh, uncontrolled power and so they thought that Ethiopia was their personal property and they convinced some people in the West, our friends in the, in the West, that they are the strong people who can hold Ethiopia together. And that was not true. Ethiopia does not need to be held together by force. Ethiopians are beautiful people. They can work together. All they need is freedom. And if they get the freedom, they will use it responsibly. So a lot of beautiful things have happened. Most of the sabotage that was implemented, financed and encouraged by Tigray Liberation Front is no more. So Ethiopia is gonna move forward very nicely. Uh, I ask our European friends to try and work with Ethiopia, find a way to accommodate uh, because Ethiopians know a little better than you as far as East Africa goes. And this old imperial concept that I'll tell you my way or the highway doesn't work anymore in the 21st century. So you gotta be accommodating 
listen to what Ethiopia is saying, listen to what Djibouti is saying, listen to what Sudan is saying, and listen to what Egypt is saying. And I think we can create a more harmonious world where Egypt doesn't, where Europe doesn't have to worry about taking so many refugees from Syria, from this, from that, the other. It's not even safe for Europe anymore because Africa has to be stable and people have to be able to live in Africa so that they don't have to go to Europe. We are almost done. So I want to give you the chance to say your last message. What, what do you want to say to Ethiopians around the world? Uh, to Ethiopian young people, I want to say, take pride in Ethiopian history. Don't listen to the people who are telling you Ethiopia is the center of famine and uh, a worthless place. Ethiopia is not worthless. Ethiopia is a very, very beautiful country, cradle of civilization, the beginning of mankind, very spiritual people, mountains, beautiful mountainous country, nice children, beautiful dogs and nice animals. So you will have a good time if you go to Ethiopia. There are a lot of work to be done, but Ethiopians who are not born, uh, who are born outside Ethiopia, they should stop being fearful of Ethiopia. Ethiopia is not going to eat you. Ethiopia is not going to harm you. And you just have to be cautious and be careful uh, as you travel because there's more, uh, more uh, safety issue. Uh, when they drive cars, they're driving old cars. Uh, traffic laws are not very strong. There are a lot of things that can happen that can harm you. But if you are careful, uh, you make sure that you transport yourself in Ethiopia with a reliable car. Don't get into a lot of trouble. Don't stay late at night. Uh, don't do anything crazy like you wouldn't do in London. Uh, drink and drive and do crazy things. So Ethiopia is a beautiful place. Young people can go and really experience Ethiopia the right way. Uh, but have guidance. You need guidance. In Ethiopia, you just can't come and join. You have to know people who have got the experience and who can teach you and help you on how to work in Ethiopia. So that's the message that I have for Ethiopian youngsters. For older Ethiopians who have been living outside Ethiopia for 40, 50 years and are scared to go back, I say, don't be scared. Go back and say hello. Tell them you, you love Ethiopia. Tell them that you can help with your long life and experience. You can share, you can write books, you can be doing a speaking engagement at the universities. They're very welcoming people. For foreigners who want to invest in Ethiopia, I think Ethiopia will be a very nice place, but make sure that you have a business plan. Make sure that it's executable. Don't forget that Ethiopia is a landlocked country for now. And so you got to consider, how am I going to be profitable? How am I going to make some money? And if you start making money, it's a very profitable place. But you got to make sure that you got to be able to take out your profits. So how do I repatriate my profits? How can I take a dividends out of Ethiopia? All those questions have to be answered properly. And Ethiopia, as they get to prepare themselves for the world, is going to take a little bit of a little bit of time to ramp up this. They don't. They have resources scarcity, uh, resources scarcity, and also uh, well-trained uh, manpower. They don't have that. It was. Don't forget, this was a, a socialist country that was living in darkness and uh, for a long time. Uh, the, the recent past hasn't been great either because the new people that came in 1991 divided Ethiopia along tribal and garbage uh, primitive uh, lines and had them fight with each other for uh, meager resources. They were fighting over water, fighting over cattle, fi fighting over goats, fighting over milk, fighting over everything. Uh, so grassland and so forth. So it is a country that is, has to stabilize. Things will get better. Uh, but the main source of the trouble have already been identified. I think Ethiopia is going to be doing great. There are a lot of uh, Americans that can benefit from Ethiopia. Go there, learn how to live a good life uh, with a very small amount of resources. 
uh, how to be grateful without having millions of dollars, because we know that money is not always the solution. We know that some of the richest people in the world are the most miserable people. And so uh, I, 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 100% being rich does not necessarily mean that you're gonna be happy. But one thing I know about Ethiopia, they are happy people. So you can learn about happiness and uh, being selfless and being able to bless others and so forth. And so what can we learn from Ethiopia is uh, it's not only the, what the US or America or United Kingdom can give for Ethiopia. Ethiopia has a lot to give for these people and they can learn if they want to, of course. But Ethiopia is a beautiful with the nicest weather, 79 degrees every day or 25 Celsius, as you say in England, 25 every day. And uh, it's just a beautiful place. Uh, you know that Ethiopia and Kenya have got the same type of weather. They're always 25 degrees, it seems to me. And uh, so if you know Kenya, you know Ethiopia. They are beautiful people. Thank you so much, Mel. It's been a pleasure talking to you on behalf of Ethiopia, Ethiopia and Digest. Thanks once again for taking time to talk to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bakara, for the opportunity to speak.